In this video, we are going to discuss how to produce different polar graphs. This is the fun stuff, the let's play part. This is the third video in a three-part series dealing with the polar coordinate system. This is based on section 7.3 out of the OpenStax Calculus book, Volume 2. In this video, all we're going to do is use the graphing calculator, a TI-84, and Desmos to produce different graphs and talk about some of their characteristics. We'll start with the Limousin, which you can see here in the picture. On the left, you'll see that I have produced the graph in Desmos by putting it into the polar graph. Remember to click on the wrench on the far right side of the screen in order to select the circular polar graph system as compared to the rectangular graph system. Limousons have different types. They don't all look like this with this beautiful inner loop. Let's talk about what makes the Limousin have this form. There are in fact two different forms that we can write for a Limousin. I've written them in a combined form here, but you could write them instead as r equals, hold on while I get it back up, r equals a plus or minus b sine theta and r equals a plus or minus b cosine theta. This is actually four separate forms, one with the plus and one with the minus for each of sine and cosine. The sine and cosine will determine which axis it is symmetric across. Since sine is y and cosine is x, you might not be surprised to see that the sine limousin is symmetric across what would be the y-axis if it were superimposed on top of this polar system. Also notice that if the magnitude of A is smaller than the magnitude of B, you will get this beautiful inner loop that you see here. Let's look at another picture. In this picture, we have instead that the magnitude of A is between the magnitude of B and its double. In the picture, I'll blow it up so you can see it a little bit better, the equation is 5 minus 3 sine of theta. A, of course, remember refers to the constant that is not attached to the trig function. B is the constant attached to the trig function. Since B is 3 and 3 is between these values here, then we have something different is the value of A. Let's write that down so we can keep it firmly in our minds. This means that A equals 5 and B in this case is the 3. Note that we're considering these to be strictly magnitudes. In this case, I'm looking for the value of A between B's magnitude and double its magnitude. B is 3 and double its magnitude would be 6 and clearly 5 does fit between there. When this is true, the limousin, which has this format, does not have an inner loop like in the previous picture. Instead, it has what we call a dent or a dimple in the side. That's an indented part in this top section here. Again, notice that because it has sign, that it is symmetric now across the line that would have represented the y-axis in a rectangular system. Thus far, we've noticed that if the magnitude of A is smaller than B, meaning the constant by itself is smaller in absolute value than the coefficient of the trig function, we have the inner loop. If the value of the coefficient is between the magnitude of the coefficient and twice that, then we have a dimple in the graph. Now you should be asking yourself, what if the magnitude of the constant is greater than double the magnitude of the coefficient? That, of course, is the third case where we get what I would call an oval-ish shape. It's not truly an oval. Let's take a look at this picture. You can tell it's not really an oval in the sense that we think of it but it is still based on the same format as the previous ones. 
but it does not have either a dent or a dimple or the inner loop. Instead, it is more oval-ish in nature. Now let's talk about circles in polar coordinates. What could be easier? They're so simple. If you want to center your circle at the origin, known in the polar coordinate system as the pole, then you simply write r equals a, where a is the radius of the circle. That's it. Nothing could be simpler. If you want to shift the circle from being centered at the pole to being centered either on the polar axis or along the line extending towards pi or pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2, then you can accomplish that with these formulas that you see here. You'll notice that centering it at 0 a would not move it left or right on a normal x-y coordinate system. Instead, it would move it up on what would be the y-axis. And you'll notice that the equation in here is sine, which of course refers to the y variable. So this makes sense. If a is positive, it will move up. When a is negative, it will move down. Likewise, we'll notice here that if the center has shifted to a comma zero, on an x-y coordinate axis, this would mean a shift to the left or the right, depending upon the sine of a. In this case, of course, cosine represents the x variable, which matches the shift to the left or the right. Let's now look at some examples of these. In the simplest example, which is the green circle, I have simply graphed a circle with the center at the pole, or the origin that you see here. This is the green one in the center. What about this purple one? This is also a circle because it is for sine of theta. Remember that the formula that you saw up here is 2a sine of theta, and a is the radius of the circle. So the radius will not be 4. Instead, the radius will be 2. Because it's sine, it will be symmetric across what would have been the y-axis, but represents the line along the radial lines pi over 2 going up and 3 pi over 2 going down. In this case, we have a circle of radius 2, which has been moved up. This is because I have a positive a of 2. What if I had a negative 2? This would move the circle down. But again, it would stay symmetric to what would be the y-axis. Similarly, you'll see in the red and blue circles that I have graph circles involving cosine. Again, we will have to remember that the radius is given by half of the coefficient, in this case, 4.5 or 9 halves. The cosine of theta when a is positive will shift it to the right, as you might expect. And when a is negative, it will shift it to the left, also as you might expect. Let's take a look at a different kind of polar graph. Here in the picture, you'll see in green an example of what's called an Archimedean spiral, named in honor of the Greek mathematician Archimedes, who did a lot of work studying different kinds of polar graphs, as well as the conic sections. They are a lot of fun, but we won't use them as often, since one of the primary things we learn to do in this section and the next is to find the area inside of a polar graph. In this case, there is no true inside because it's like a maze and it's open. You'll notice here in the picture that I graphed when theta was between 0 and 12 pi, which is the default range on Desmos. If I was able to continue going out, the spiral would continue to grow, but Desmos does not allow you to go forever. In rectangular coordinate systems, this would be given by this enormously complicated equation that you see here, and this is assuming that the value of a is zero. Looking at the equation in polar coordinates, the equation for this spiral is a very simple 2 plus 3 theta. Even if we were to make the a a 0, 
representing what in polar coordinates is r equal b theta would require this nightmarish equation that you see here for rectangular system. This is one of the reasons that we use the polar coordinate system for graphs that curve and bend and rotate in ways similar to circles, hyperbolas, parabolas, and ellipses. In this particular polar graph, you'll see a logarithmic spiral. This is what gives a nautilus seashell its characteristic shape. It is not like the Archimedean spiral. Notice that the Archimedean spiral has sort of as its base a very regular circular pattern, but in the nautilus shape, or the logarithmic spiral, the distance between the loops is getting farther apart as it goes further out. You may encounter one or more of these in the homework. We won't use them for very much other than determining arc length. But we can use these when we're studying how to find arc length in polar coordinate systems. The equation for a logarithmic spiral is r equals a, a coefficient which is a constant, times another constant b raised to the theta power. That is, r equals a times b to the theta power. That is why it's called a logarithmic spiral, because of course it is based on an exponential equation, which is the inverse function to a logarithm. Now let's take a look at the next shape, called a cardioid. We will see these a lot. Cardioids are a very common shape to see when you're studying polar graphs. They make good shapes to find the area inside of or between a cardioid and another shape. They're also good for arc length as well, but we'll primarily look at them probably in terms of their area. There are four different equations which you see here, which of course could have been written in a form with two only by writing a plus or minus in between. These are not the same as what's above. I will not expect you to have these memorized. I don't expect you to look at the equation and go, oh, that's a cardioid. However, I hope that over time, you will come to recognize a cardioid when you see one. A cardioid is sort of heart-shaped. Now, how is it different from the limosome with the dimple? Let's take a look closer at this picture. When you look at this picture, can you see here that that point where it dents in is in fact a sharp cusp? That's one of the primary differences between a cardioid and a limosome. Here at this point, we have a cusp as opposed to what we had on the limosome. Let's look back at the limosome graph. You'll notice here on the limosome that while it is also dented in, it is not a sharp cusp like in the picture of the cardioid. It is instead smooth. Let's look at the graph of some cardioids and see if we can recognize the pattern. Let's first focus on the red one. The red one is similar to the original that was drawn with a sharp cusp there at the pole. You'll notice that it is symmetric across the polar axis. This is because the cosine of theta and the cosine of negative theta produce the same value. If you look at this graph which produced it, the fact that it has cosine theta lets us know that since cosine represents the x-coordinate, that it will be symmetric across what would be the x-axis. Notice that the same is true of the blue graph, which also has a cosine of theta. It also has a cusp at the origin. It is also symmetric with respect to the x-axis, but not the polar axis since it only goes to the right. It is instead symmetric to the line that includes the polar axis and the radial line at pi. Now, let's take a look at the next two and see how they're different. Notice that the green and purple cardioids are symmetric instead to the radial lines through pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, what would be the y-axis if we were on an x-y coordinate system. I've superimposed these on the x-y so that you can see what they look like. When you're looking at this here, notice then 
that the sine is what's causing it to be symmetric with respect to what would be the y-axis. A positive sign has it mostly above the polar axis, and a negative has it mostly below. The positive cosine is mostly to the right, and the negative cosine is mostly to the left. Remember that up and right are the positive directions, down and left are negative. The next really cool polar graph that we can look at are called roses. They're called roses because they have petals on them. The petals tend to be exactly the same size and shape. Now, this looks like I have two different sizes, but in fact, this is two roses. The red represents the first rose with four petals given by the equation two equals sine of two theta. The second rose is given by the equation four sine of two theta. If you look here at the form of the equations, you'll see that there's no plus or minus to be had here. There are instead simply two different forms, one with cosine, one with sine. They can have a numeric coefficient on the outside, and the argument to the trig function can also have a constant on the inside. Let's see if we can figure out what the relationship is. First, we'll focus on the 2 and the 4 on the outside. Sine and cosine, no matter what their argument is, go between 1 and negative 1. That means the largest radius I can get on the red rows is 2. If you look here and you were to make a line from the center out to the edge of the petal, you would find the distance there is precisely 2 on every petal. In other words, the coefficient outside the trig function gives you the true length of that petal. That means that the length of the petals on the blue rows are four long. What is the relationship between the two that is inside the argument to the trig function and the graph? In order to determine that, let's take a look at some more roses and see if that will give us a clue. You'll see in the next two pictures that I have changed in the first one, instead of having two theta as the argument, I now have three theta. I've gone from four petals when the argument was two theta to only three petals when the argument is three theta. Looking at this then, you might conjecture that perhaps if the number is odd, you get that many petals, and if the number is even, you get double that number of petals. And if that's what you think, you're absolutely right. If this two were a four, I would in fact have eight petals. If it were a five though, since five is odd, I'd get five petals. What was the effect of switching from sine to cosine? It rotated the rows. In other words, when it was sine, it was symmetric across what would have been the y-axis. When it's cosine, it is now symmetric across what would have been the x-axis. It has rotated the rows. In this picture, you'll see that I have the graphs of 2 cosine of 2 theta and 4 cosine of 2 theta. Because the argument to the trig function has an even coefficient, I would expect to find double that number of petals, or 4, and there are. Because it's cosine, I would expect this to be symmetric with respect to the axis that would correspond to the x-axis, and it is. Notice, however, it is also symmetric with respect to the y. Let's compare this, though, to the one that had sine of 2 theta and on the inside. In this case, I also get something that is symmetric with respect to both axes, but they are not the same. Notice that in the case where I have sine, the petals are not actually touching what would be the x or y axes except at the origin. That is not what is happening on the cosine. On the cosine, it is instead touching at the tips of the petals and at the origin.
Again, it is rotated. While this is certainly great information, I do not expect you to have any of this memorized, nor do I expect you to want to write it down to know it on an exam. What I want is for you to recognize what's happening and to remember, perhaps, that when the argument to a trig function on a rose is even, you get double the petals, and when it's odd, you get precisely that many petals. If you remember that the graphs with sine and cosine are rotated, that will make me super happy. Let's now take a look at producing some really cool graphs. The first graph I want to look at is something that's called the butterfly curve because it looks, well, like a butterfly. You'll notice here that this form right here looks somewhat like the logarithmic spiral that we saw earlier. This is Euler's number e raised to the cosine of theta power minus 2 cosine of 4 theta plus sine cubed of theta divided by 4. Go grab your graphing calculator and let's try to graph it and see if we can produce a good graph. I've made the equation a little bit larger to give you time to copy it down and then we'll produce it on the graphing calculator. Pause the video here so you can get it entered into your graphing calculator. Here is what the graphing calculator looks like with that equation plugged in. When you're putting this in, you need to be careful and be sure that you do in fact close over these parentheses that follow the trig functions since there's more to follow. I'm going to move the cursor across so that you can see the entire equation. Also be sure that you don't use the negative symbol instead of the subtraction sign. If you do, it will interpret it as being multiplied by a negative 2 and not subtracting 2 times the cosine. Make sure that as you move across that you continue to close parentheses where needed. You'll notice on the last part where it was sine cubed that instead I put the sine cubed all into parentheses with the cube on the outside. Notice also that I had to include the argument to the sine function theta over 4 in parentheses which had to be closed before I could close the sine and cube it. Let's now take a look at our window to make sure that we're going on a reasonable range. We're going 0 to 2 pi, and you'll notice my theta step is again pi divided by 60. I have no idea what this is going to look like, so we're going to let the graphing calculator choose the best window. Go to Zoom and select Zoom Fit. You can scroll down to 0 or you can enter 0 for Zoom Fit. It will calculate for the values of theta between 0 and 2 pi the best possible x and y graph that will produce the entire picture. It will, however, undoubtedly not be squared off. You'll see that it is drawing it here and you can watch it draw. Notice that it keeps going for quite a while. All right. I think it's just about done. We don't get a great level of detail in here. We do want to make sure that the window is proportional. So hit zoom and then choice 5, which is zoom square. This will redraw the graph, making sure that the distance on the x-axis and the y-axis are proportional. This does give me a slightly different look to it, but not a great deal different. You can also use the key as well if you want to trace it out and watch the values go from one end to the other. Let's take a look now at what it looks like when we put it into Desmos. On Desmos, I got a much more elaborate picture with greater detail, but notice I also went to 8pi. I wonder now if we go back and change our window to go from 0 to 8 pi if we can get a better picture. Let's try it. Pause the video, try it, 
and then turn it back on to see if your picture matches mine. Remember to leave theta's step at something like pi divided by 60. If your picture does not match mine, it's probably because you didn't wait long enough. It took my graphing calculator a full one to two minutes to draw this graph going from zero to eight pi. However, you can see that there is a great deal more detail now in the picture. Let's go back and look at another exciting polar graph. We're going to talk about roses again, but this time we want to talk about roses with irrational coefficients. An irrational coefficient will give a space filling curve. What happens if it's rational but not an integer? If it's a rational number but not an integer, it should be what we call a closed curve, meaning eventually it should come back to where it started. However, I will warn you that on Desmos, there can be an error with some rational numbers because Desmos is approximating the fraction. Watch out for this and don't expect it to be exact. When you graph this particular graph, it should produce a closed image. It should not go forever and fill up the space. But if the system drawing the picture is approximating the rational number, it may fill the space by accident. Let's take a look at another one. This is a rose with a rational but not an integer coefficient. In other words, it's 9 over 4. You'll see here that it has produced a lot of petals, lots and lots of petals. By closed, what we mean is that if it were originally starting here, then eventually it would stop here, and then it would continue to trace out the same shape over and over without crossing itself again. That's what we mean by a closed shape. It eventually returns to the starting point and then retraces its steps all along the way. Keep in mind, though, that Desmos and the graphing calculator are going to approximate these rational numbers. Depending on the rational number, it may or may not produce the right curve. What about an irrational coefficient? On this next graph, we have five cosine of the quantity pi times theta divided by two. We're gonna watch theta change and see what happens. Now, because pi is an irrational number, the coefficient of the argument pi divided by four must also be irrational. In this picture, theta went from zero to 12 pi. One of the disadvantages to Desmos is it does not allow you to make theta be negative at this point in time. In that sense, you may be better off using your graphing calculator. If you get this picture, this is from zero to 12 pi. If I were to do this on the graphing calculator, it would probably take a couple of minutes to get that far out. Realize that every pi requires it to calculate 60 different points. That means to get 12 pi, I'm having to calculate 12 times 60 or 720 points. Then it has to connect them smoothly. Let's watch what happens when we increase theta from zero to 12 pi to zero to 24 pi. You'll notice that it is getting a denser picture in the middle, but it's clear that down over here, it has not traced over its graph again. Let's double this upper end again and go to 48. When we go to 48, you can see that it has filled in and it seems to be more or less symmetric across itself. If we increase it again from 48 pi, keeping in mind that on the graphing calculator, this could take five minutes to compute, let's look at 96 pi it is getting to be a much denser picture with the lines starting to overlap a little bit, but not quite. It's not closed. It's never quite getting back to where it started so that it can exactly retrace its steps. Instead, it's almost side by side with its previous steps. 
In the next picture, I increase to 200 pi. In this picture, you'll see now that what we have is almost a circle, but with some open white flex in the center. This is what we mean by a space filling curve. If you allow this to keep going forever, you got it. It's going to cover up the whole space and fill it in. Now Desmos does have a limit, which I believe is somewhere around 3000 pi. And in this one, I only had to go to 300 pi. Notice that 300 pi has pretty much filled in all the space with a solid color. Keep in mind, again, that even when the coefficient is a rational number, and it should instead produce a space that retraces itself and does not completely fill the space, that Desmos and graphing calculators can have difficulty with that, and they may instead approximate the rational number and accidentally fill the space, though the true curve would not. This is the end of this video, which concludes our introduction to polar coordinate systems and how do you produce polar graphs. In the next section, we'll be looking at finding the area inside of a polar curve and also calculating arc length.